as scholars in the profession, but also as people who are training students into um, becoming lawyers for our times. And I think we'll, we'll briefly just, and, and Anup and Saurabh sort of um, stop me, correct me if I'm, if I'm going off track from what our plan is, but I think our, um, our goal is to take about, you know, seven to 10 minutes each, just to tell you a little bit about our own journeys. Um, uh, you might know way more um, about some of us than others, but uh, I just I just want to spend a little bit of time telling you where we started and hopefully through the course of that journey, you're going to have a sense of how, um, uh, what parts of this process have been important for us and maybe that has some uh, sparks of connection or contribution that will take the discussion forward. Um, and then we want to open it up to really discussion and questions because I think part of what's useful here is to um, engage with both students and alumni about the things that work, the things that don't work, but also the usefulness of how to change one of those categories to the other. So how do you actually make the things that don't work into the things that might work or might work better? Um, uh, so I'll start. I'm um, Swetha Balakrishnan. I am one of the um, first batches of the school. So 2000, God, that sounds so long ago. <laughs> I graduated in 2004. Um, Nalsar was really my home. Like, I, I don't think I, I think I became a scholar first there and I became a scholar again when I came back to teach uh, there. I uh, graduated in 2004. I worked for a couple of years in a firm in Bombay, um, Amarchand Mangaldas, and then I came back to teach for a year. Um, and then I came to the US in 2007 um, to do an LLM and then to do a couple of postdocs and then to do a PhD in sociology. Um, I'm a professor now at um, uh, the U University of California at Irvine. I'm at the law school, but I have joint appointments at um, the sociology department, the Asian American studies department, and the criminology law and society department. And these, these sort of associations have been, I don't think I'd have had any of those, any of, I, I don't think I'd have sought any of those associations if I didn't go to um, college in Nalsar. And I know what a strong statement that is. And I was thinking about my comments for today. And I realized that's actually true. My first socio legal education, like I'm on the board of trustees of this uh, Law and Society Association board, which is one of the largest global organizations for, um, for law and society research. And I realized while I was giving comments at that meeting that everything that I was saying there was a thing that was first seeded in my brain when I was a student in Nalsa, right? And I, is that intentional? Was that what the school was created to do? I don't know, but it incidentally was definitely how I was socialized. And I think there's something really powerful about the role of socialization. And I think the role that law schools have in such socialization. Um, and for me, the biggest takeaway for my time in Alsar, but also the ways in which it set me on a path to doing research on the legal profession, on legal education, um, on diversity, on inclusion. All of that started because I was really, um, I really, I really felt like the the time my time at Nalsar was such a socio legal experience, right? Like they, no one, no one called it that. There weren't words and brackets for that, but that's actually what it was. And it's made me think about how powerful it is to do a thing without calling a thing a thing. And I know I'm being really vague here. I'm sorry. I do a lot of theory, so this is this might be more vague than um, anybody who's looking for a quick in and out version of this talk was expecting. But I think what I'm trying to say is a lot of the socio legal education I got in Nalsar wasn't called that, right? So we had professors that were um, really committed to teaching from um, from sort of both an activist position, and I know Anup's going to talk a little bit more about that, or from a sort of grounded <clears throat> grounded local politics position, as Saurabh's going to talk about in a second. And all of these ways came intuitively for the professors that I had. So, um, um, you know, Amita Danda, who's still there, and Kalpana Kanabiran were like, the two people that really shaped my legal education, right? Like everything I had thought about and done following that really started because they were my professors when I was in law school. And um, the importance of early socialization like that is that you never lose that shtick. So when people say, oh, are you gonna be a public interest lawyer or a corporate lawyer? My, my note is always says no, there, there aren't these like clear lines of who's a public lawyer and who's a private lawyer. Good legal education must get you to do all things you do with good intent, right? So this idea that things have to be in specific categories is not something I, I, I think is a way to approach it. I think there are ways in which people across different um, work styles, different, different work capacities can find ways in which their work becomes meaningful and legal education has such a central role to like mold that. 
Um, and so, if, I mean, I, and I, since I'm guessing a lot of alumni are on, maybe some alumni are on this call, um, there is a tendency to think of public interest lawyers as a specific kind of higher host lawyer and other kinds of lawyers as having sold their soul. And this is a categorization that happens over and over again. I teach a first year law student class now um, on the legal profession and like sort of the biggest divide and the biggest, this is a historic divide. It's a divide that keeps repeating itself is the public interest students versus the corporate law students, right? And there's this clean divide of the public interest students being like, I chose the high road and it's so important for me to do this important work I do. And the corporate law students being like, you know what, I'm so tired of this high horse and yeah, I have to save my family and yeah, I have to like pay bills. Yeah, I have to take this job to like do whatever the hell I want to do. And some people actually really like securities litigation. Like this is not something to complain about. It's not a thing to apologize for. Um, and making space for all of those identities and allowing each of these people to have ways to talk past and through and with each other that I think is the role of legal education. And sort of when you're thinking about how do you create a good law school, what's the role of a good law school right now? When you're in a school that sort of thinks of itself as progressive, that's trying to do the work of a progressive law school, that's trying to create public interested lawyers, and I'm using that word very deliberately, public interested, not public interest. Um, having lawyers across sites, having lawyers across organizational choices, still thinking of themselves as having something to contribute to the society that they're creating, that socialization is what is central. And I think that socialization um, can only happen if you are training students to be interdisciplinary thinkers, if you're training them in the social sciences and the humanities. Um, we're in the middle of like a enough, enough cascading world crises right now um, that make one wonder whether <laughs> there are, um, there are there's any hope of like having humanities or any hope in like reading poetry when the world is going to shit. And, oh, is it recorded? Of course it's recording when I say shit. But there's, a, there's, there's also usefulness in that. And I think the connection between the law and um, logic of like what law can do in connection with other disciplines and what law can do in connection with other kinds of work is at the central root of um, what good legal education can and ought to be. Um, if, I'm, if I'm keeping these comments really vague, it is pretty intentional. I sort of think there's something, um, there's something sort of both useful about seeing a system from the outside having been made from the system, right? Like I haven't been a law, legal academic in India. I have not been in the country for now almost 17 years like i this is not this is not where i work i study purely from the outside and i think that's on the one hand as a researcher greatly greatly advantages so i can i have a perspective on it that's um somewhat neutral you could argue right and the flip side of it is this is not my day job like this is not where i work so i am not likely to be able to talk to you about what is good and what is bad and what is sticky about it uh, because i'm not doing it from the inside and one of my um, I think I think from a research and ethical perspective, like sort of speaking about a system that you're not part of just because you're from it seems really uh, top down in a way that's not useful. So I'm going to stop my comments here and just say um, we, we're going to listen to from two more people who are entrenched in the system and are thinking through legal education from the ground up. Um, and I'm so excited to be on the panel with these two because I've gone to college with them and it seems like it seems like yesterday that we were all fighting over at mama's um which which is the one constant that now sir continues to have i imagine um but i i'm only being part flippant right it's such an honor to really be with um colleagues that were friends and, and have been friends for so long so um anup do you want to go next and then sarab can go and then sarab's going next okay sarab goes next oh, yeah. great well, thank you, Shweta. Uh, you said you are an outsider. In many ways, we have been firmly entrenched, as you said, within the academic system. But it's great that you spoke of MAMA because for me to go back to Nalsar and see a lot of changes, the two things that were among the stuff that were constant, one was the Sunday mess food and MAMA. And it was very reassuring that among all the changes that have happened, few things that still remain with us. But coming back to more serious stuff than food and mama's canteen. It's an important moment for us to reflect on legal education within NLUs because 
apart from National Law School, which has a much older history, most of the other NLUs are relatively young, but have at the same time completed around 20 to 25 years by now, which means it's an important juncture at which we can take stock. And personally, for many of us, we have spent almost a decade within NLU. And some of the things that I'm going to speak about would be based on my own experience. And I'll try to think aloud on few questions that have troubled me and maybe raise them for the panel as well as for the other audience, other members of the audience to reflect on and perhaps have some form of brainstorming on those. And two points that I would like to float right at the beginning. One is the nature of scholarship and academic research and balancing with teaching that's happening within NLU. And the second is the relevance of NLUs within the broader paradigm of state policies and contribution of NLUs to policy making, especially at the local level. How best can NLUs do that? Now, as far as teaching and scholarship goes, and one of the things that I've realized and haven't done very well is the challenge that faculty have had in trying to take out time for intensive research. And this is one area where I think NLUs have to think about in terms of structural reforms as well. Is it sufficient to say, say that, yes, we encourage faculty and young junior teachers to research? Or is there enough in terms of incentive, enough in terms of institutional space, which allows faculty to do that research? And also we need to understand that the quality of research is certainly going to have a direct linkage with the quality of teaching that we do. So it's not something that's an ancillary part of law school life, but something that's integrally connected with academia. So one is the amount of institutional support that young scholars have for research, both in terms of funding, in terms of time in terms of other research support that the institutions can provide. That's one area that we need to look a little more closely at. But I'll also like to drop on what Shweta said about the emphasis on public law and this high horse that scholars and practitioners often ride on. And maybe we may not have the exact numbers, but it's fair to say that most of the young NLU graduates who had alums who have moved into academia. Most of us have worked on different aspects of public law and private law scholarship has generally been neglected. And in some way that's a shame because there is fair degree of scope for work within commercial laws and other. From a practitioner's point of view, considerable improvements have happened the scholar courses that have been started and we have a fair number of practitioners from various law firms and even advocates come and teach in different NLUs. But in terms of academic research, I think the numbers would be minority. And perhaps it would be fair to say that private law in this country has been under 15 to 20 years in the sort of scholarship that has emerged. And when you recognize that fields like contract law, fields like property are basic areas within our jurisprudence, and unless you have a clear grasp on the fundamental concepts and the evolution of those concepts within contract law. A lot of the other more specialized branches and our understanding of those can be compromised. So I think law schools need to think more in terms of how to perhaps nudge students towards and graduates towards looking at private law scholarship also a little more seriously. And I believe, and I must certainly say that for young students who are part of this panel, if you are interested in private law, academia is a field that has immense scope for contribution. And it's not as if those who are interested in securities law, those who are interested in property law, or people who are genuinely interested in conceptual development within insurance law and other similar branches. There is massive scope for research, a massive scope for knowledge generation, even within the academia. And it's not just that you only have law firms and others, of course, those are far more lucrative. And perhaps few years of work as a professional certainly will enhance your capacity as a scholar. But I believe there is greater need for mm -hmm. emphasis on private law scholarship as well. A couple of other things that I'd like to speak about in this context, something that perhaps would also come up on in terms of questions, is how to encourage the master's level program. 
because the quality of scholarship and even the extent of scholarship that a university and a law school can generate also depends on the quality of its master's level program and of course its doctoral program and some law schools have done better than others and i understand that nalsar has comparatively focused far more on masters programs in the recent years in the years we graduated but i think every other law school also needs to learn from that and invest far more in the both in qualitative as well as quantitative parameters that we associate with masters level program and i'm sure all of us would understand that generally we have given some kind of stepmotherly treatment towards the masters program and especially even as students they are often at the margins of the law school life which means if the quality of learning and teaching that can happen within the law school for masters program is comparatively compromised and that is something that needs to be improved upon especially given that the quality of future teaching would depend also on how rigorous your masters level programs are we do have over the years a handful of nlu alum beach batch getting into academia but when you look at the scale the number of masters program alumni who get into teaching is far more than undergrad level alumni and therefore our quality of teaching is centrally connected with how best we also train our masters level students and that's one of the area perhaps we can have little more discussion on the specifics of how to do that but that's one area that we'll have to certainly reflect on a little more the other thing that i spoken of was the whole question of law schools co contributing to the broader public policy debate especially also at the local level again a challenge that many of the other law schools have faced as well at one level many of us have been quite insulated and also the battle has been often a defensive one how do we keep state governments from interfering how do we maintain our autonomy from government intrusion into our own academic and administrative decision making but as much as that autonomy has to be maintained that cannot be at the cost of contribution to wider engagement with the bar wider engagement with the judiciary and public policies that are happening some bit of developments have happened in the last four years but at the same time it's obvious that we haven't really contributed as much as we can in pre legislative debates in civil society collaboration and i think that's one area perhaps all of us have to work of specific ways in which we can improve also to be fair being relatively young law schools many of our alumni are still comparatively junior in terms of their stage of their career but at the same time as an institution most of us have have completed close to 20 years and more than 20 years for some of us certainly for nalsa and when that is the case i think we have to really pull up our socks and one area where i believe there is tremendous scope for contribution is the kind of policy engagement that's happening at the state level if you look at the trajectory of governance while the current central government and its tendency towards centralization is a bit of an anomaly but by and large more and more decision making has gradually shifted to state governments and while there is some degree of focus on law making legislative debates at the central level very little is being done at the changes that are happening at the state level and i think law schools need to invest in developing watchdogs monitors as to bills that are being presented before the state assemblies look at the way in which high court administrative mechanisms are working the sort of research that daksh has been doing over the last few years perhaps we need to think in terms of how law schools can act to that replicate that model and be now pretty much almost every major state capital or every major state has an nlu and if you recognize that then there is tremendous scope for nlus to develop their own competence and expertise in local level developments both at the administrative judicial and at the political level that's happening and perhaps few more thoughts can come into how we can do that for now perhaps i can stop here and maybe through questions and answers and other conversation we can take some of the others thank you right. uh, uh thanks aura uh and uh, i'm just going to take 10 minutes to go through uh 
some of the issues that uh, I've, out, I've, I've, I've uh, noted down. And um, I'll just start quickly, and I think it's important to just outline my own journey so that you understand where I come from um, in terms of... Um, um, I, I, I joined law school with very different uh, intentions, to be honest, in my first year. Uh, I, 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 I went there to make a lot of money for certain other reasons. And I think it was my internship in um, uh, Gujarat after, after the violence in 2002 that really changed a lot of things for me. Um, and, and the other extraneous reason just didn't work out. So, but anyway, uh, so uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think it was always this culture of um, very strong public law engagement in NALSA that drove me to, uh, towards this academic uh, career. And even there, I get uh, the, the teaching of public law and the and interaction with uh, social sciences and humanities, which was certainly much stronger uh, than private law teaching and scholarship. And I get that sort of the kind of teachers who had influence on my thinking, uh, where the, uh, I mean, at least uh, where the kinds were dealing with that kind of interdisciplinary thinking and uh, teaching. Um, my, my first love actually uh, was constitutional law, right? Uh, and, and it was taught by Professor Arabi in a manner that, in a manner that I don't teach constitutional law now. Uh, uh, but it was it was very sort of black letter law, but it thoroughly fascinated me in terms of uh, just to show the importance of knowing black letter, uh, right? And and of knowing the cases and and that kind of analytical approach, and that 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 really was um, uh, a tremendous, I think, legal training in just how on on how to do some very basic things right. Um, so and then I did uh, I was abroad for about five years, just I guess trying to figure out what to do with life and uh, got some degrees in those five years and I came to NLU Delhi uh, in 2012 and I've been here since. Uh, and in terms of my own reflection of my time from being a student at NALSAR to um, uh, postgraduate um, studies abroad and then teaching at uh, NLU Delhi for the last now almost eight years, uh, I think there's a fundamental question on what is the purpose of legal education in that sense that, that we just need to think about and uh, and we can go into detail into some of these questions and that whole tension between uh, are, we, are, we in the, are we in the business of training for the profession or uh, in terms of, oh, do you know drafting or do you know how to draft up a contract or, I mean, all of those things might be important and in terms of are we training people for the profession and the industry and um, judgeship or I mean is that is, are we in the training mode or are we in the education mode and I would think that uh, legal education uh, needs to sit in that space of uh, of being in that education mode for, for training in, especially in a country like this the requirements of what lawyers need to do uh, I, I would think we, we are firmly in that education mode uh, and, and I know it is it's, it's a, a str strong criticism of the education, even coming out of the law schools, that uh, we are not creating lawyers that are profession ready or that are, um, are ready for a work in the law firms. Uh, and, and in that sense, you're, the law firms are just interested in somebody giving a stamp of approval for over five years' time that somebody is qualified and has a law degree. And we can, and we can get into that whether how much of uh, credence should we give to that kind of criticism and. What is, a, what is this balance between education and training that we need to achieve in law schools? Um, I think overall, and, 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 and of course, as, as, as a law student in Nalsar, I, I think I, I rode that high horse that uh, uh, Shweta was talking about of where, you know, uh, everybody who wanted to go to a law firm was selling their soul uh, and having uh, mildly flirted with that as well, uh, right? Uh, in terms of uh, and, 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 and I think it's a position, uh, the, the fallacy of that position has only revealed itself uh, over the years, right? And, and I think, and, and, and I come to view legal education as some, also as the mold of citizenship education in the sense that uh, uh, irrespective of what students choose to do with their careers, I think there has to be a certain orientation in thinking about the law 
uh, and the various processes in, in whatever field that thinking might be applied and that, that legal education and that uh, aptitude has to be developed in law school and and I think certain and and especially in publicly funded universities I think there is that uh, uh, particular obligation that the, that the people of this country are paying for your education and it's not to mean that well, everybody should become a, a cause lawyer or a, or a poverty lawyer right uh, but it's that there is a certain obligation that arises from being publicly funded uh, it certainly costs the universities a lot more to run the law schools that uh, the, the publicly funded law schools than the fees are charged uh, so there is there is that complex ethical dynamic of what is expected of you and, I, and for me what is expected is that as students as teachers that uh, whatever student might go on to become and whatever teachers are teaching there has to be a certain public ethic to it and then it is that education in that ethic irrespective of whether you're doing securities law or insurance or whatever else uh, that 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 conversation and that education and of that public ethic is, is very very important in terms of imagining uh, legal education. Um, uh, there, I, and, 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 and the entire model of five years versus three years uh, is one question to be addressed. And the other question is how useful have been, have this, has this model of a single discipline universities been, right? I mean, in terms of are we better off having legal education in uh, more integrated universities rather than this kind of and how much of this cut off nature of law schools is attributable to the fact that we are not located within a multidisciplinary uh, university right and then and what are the consequences of that uh, is I think it's time to reflect on that experience of uh, nearly two to three decades of these law schools of uh, what have been the pros and cons of being a single discipline uh, uh, institution right. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, and one, one thing I'm, I'm in my own work at NLU Delhi, I've, I've had uh, the privilege and the support from the university to do some uh, uh, very interesting work that is interesting to me uh, on the criminal justice system in terms of uh, first the death penalty research project uh, and, and then what is now project 39A uh, in terms of uh, work uh, both in terms of research into the criminal justice system and intervention in terms of legal aid and uh, representation of death row prisoners and also under trial prisoners. Um, it's, I mean, and, and it's, it's a, it has been an interesting experience in terms of uh, along with teaching and I think it has had an effect on my teaching uh, uh, and, and I teach much less now than when I started. Uh, I'm. Uh, Quite honestly, I'm also far less interested in teaching now than when I started. Um, this that's a confession. Uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, in terms of just the space that NLU Delhi has given, and I know that it is a space that is not easily or readily available uh, in other places. It has allowed us uh, to set up offices in Delhi, Pune, Nagpur, uh, and 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 it's it's almost. Uh, how do I say this? I mean, it's it almost feels like a startup. I mean, with 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 almost uh, 50 full-time employees across three offices, uh, student involvement, um, and and of course, it also has meant very challenging us um, in terms of raising funding, sustaining that funding, uh, uh, managing that equation with the university. But certainly, that has impacted. Um, uh, my teaching and, and and that's a question to ask in terms of uh, uh, and, and that's a difficult ethical question to ask in terms of uh, is there a point in having somebody like me here teaching much lesser than what he should be and contributing time and, and, and using much much more of my time on on efforts like uh, what we've been doing with project 39A. Uh, what is the value of that? Of course I, I mean I do believe there is value and, and this and this is the kind of work that universities must generate and and universities just cannot be teaching shops right uh, they have to generate good quality and uh, and relevant scholarship uh, and, and and i think all of that work contributes to that because i think that really enriches my teaching 
when I go into the classroom, all the work and the perspectives that I bring from the ground, even if even if I'm teaching legal methods to the first years, I think it, it enriches it in a certain kind of way. Uh, and and there is that uh, interesting dynamic between work of this kind, which is research, intervention, and teaching, um, uh, and 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 also in terms of uh, uh, I think just in questions of uh, how does it impact scholarship? Are you are you then this there's almost this construction of a of of a scholar or an academic being neutral, and is that is that neutrality compromised in terms of, uh, or, or is that academic approach to an issue compromised because you've taken sides on an issue, right? In terms of, if I were to write on the death penalty now, uh, I, I mean, it's almost impossible for me to be like, I don't know, objective. And I know I'm using very loaded, controversial terms, and we can get to that, but that's that's an issue to uh, worry about, right? Um, in terms of, uh, uh, and then I think reflecting on my work on the death penalty with the death penalty research project and project 39A, it, it has been a very interesting experience to work with, uh, and, and, I, and, and especially on the death penalty research project to work with uh, nearly a hundred undergraduate students in the age group of 18 to 22, um, outside the classroom, field work across prisons in India with death row prisoners and their families. Uh, it, it was a very interesting experience. It's a challenging experience. It, it, uh, I think it, it, had, it had many opportunities, risks, and, 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 and benefits in that sense. And then I think uh, at that age group, there is, there is very little that uh, students think is not possible. And that kind of drive, that energy, that optimism, and that idealism will, uh, is irreplaceable. Right, but also comes with a certain kind of impatience with that age group of wanting to see results immediately, frustrations, uh, disillusionment, right? Saying that going and seeing the hard realities of our criminal justice system and the violent realities of the criminal justice system just pushes, uh, and just to see that none of this is going to change, uh, maybe not much is not going to change in our lifetimes or their lifetimes, uh, really is also brings about a certain disillusionment. And of course, there are students who are inspired by that. It influences their career choices, right? Um, but yeah, it's, there, are, there are certain uh, serious risks that come with uh, that kind of work as well. Uh, but, and, I, and I want to use that as a segue into experiential education in, um, in law schools and the state of internships and clinical education. Uh, both leave much to be desired in terms of uh, what are we doing with our internship program? What is the idea behind it? Um, uh, and, and I think that the kind of uh, pedagogical engagement with those two components, internship and clinical education, uh, is, is really something that we have not thought through. Uh, and how should that feed into classroom learning, right? It's, it's almost, uh, uh, and, 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 and I guess different law schools have different experiences of this. But generally, particularly on legal education, I mean, on, on clinical education, uh, there really hasn't been that kind of thinking. And clinical education need not just be legal aid, going and telling uh, uh, economically marginalized people about their rights or the different programs that the state legal service authority has or, not, or the national legal service authority has. I'm not talking of that. It could very much be uh, 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 a, a clinical program on insurance or consumer law, whatever it is. I think there is a certain thinking about clinical education itself uh, as, as a pedagogical method uh, that, uh, and, and, and I don't think there is anything different about how we run our clinical courses, about how we run our other courses really. Um, uh, if, any, if at all anything they run, uh, in terms of quality, uh, it's much worse, one would think, right? Um, uh, I, I just flagged that issue and I know I'm running out of time. Uh, in terms of research and scholarship coming out of law schools, um, I think the overall reality is that uh, law school faculty are burdened with too much teaching, right? And there is increasing pressure to, uh, to have larger batch sizes, involves a whole lot of uh, other administrative work, teaching work, and 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 law schools really need to 
and and i think this this ties into the rather skewed incentive structures within the ugc for promotion right uh, and in terms of how faculty are promoted really is not the quality of your scholarship has very little to do with that incentive structure right uh, it it is a very numbers oriented game and i don't want to get into the details of uh, what it is but it is an it is a structure that does not incentivize quality scholarship it incentivizes number of publications it doesn't i mean i know there are efforts to check where things are being published india is the home of predatory i mean sort of those kind of fake journals right plagiarism is a concern in indian in an indian uh, legal academia and across uh, uh, academia in india uh, so that there is no real in, i mean i wouldn't think there is in any real incentive in the structure for quality scholarship right uh, and, and 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 i mean and that, that's not to say that there aren't brilliant people in these law schools producing brilliant scholarship but i'm saying that in institutionally structurally that incentive structure is rather skewed right um in terms of uh, uh i i am i quite honestly i am i am quite in terms of undergraduate writing i i might be i have a very unpopular view on this i am skeptical of undergraduate writing right uh, in terms of uh, i i'd rather have undergraduates read a lot more first before they write uh, and and it becomes this kind of um, uh, and 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 also have institutions invest a lot more in training to read and write uh, read and write the law right and 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 our legal methods courses leave a lot to be desired uh, there is massive underinvestment in our legal methods courses it is a course that is very heavy has to be heavy it can't be an introduction to jurisprudence course right uh, it 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 is meant to be a course to develop legal skills and that requires a lot of investment in terms of how exercises are structured feedback how to read case law how to write case analysis how to write essays and and i think that that foundation uh and i think we need to spend a lot more time with our undergraduates uh laying those foundations not just in the legal methods course but across courses right and sort of integrate that element of training for scholarship and training for research across courses which does not happen and i guess uh, less is spoken about the projects uh uh the better if only Uh, law students were uh, motivated enough to collaborate in the manner that they collaborate for getting project drafts from each other across the country uh, in innovative ways and learning innovative ways to beat turnitin uh, if those creative energies were i often think if those creative energies were channeled elsewhere we, are, we might be telling different stories about uh, our law school so i i i stop with that i I'll, i'll stop with that and open uh the floor to questions uh between the three of us we have uh touched upon a whole host of issues and feel free to ask us any question you want and we we'll, we we'll try and take off from there and see what are the larger implications of your question so please don't hesitate uh to ask as specific uh questions as you'd like and we we'll, we we'll try and answer them so yeah if you can either send in your questions on the uh q and a feature or on the um uh, uh on the on the chat yeah thank you i think there are a couple of questions um in the q and a So I, I'll start with the first one. So the first one says, um, "Your views on I don't know if everyone can read this, but since it's getting recorded, maybe it's useful to like read it because they're not going to have the chat transcript." Um, your views on doing the LLB after graduating in another discipline rather than doing the LLB or become LLB, uh, because the NLUs only focus on doing this after class twelve. Completely agree. Other disciplines do bring a lot. Um, part of this. part of the model part of the structure of the model is that it was supposed to be an innovation to how legal education was done um and the five year model has a lot of advantages because uh, especially for um 
I actually think it has an inclusion diversity advantage in some sense because it it for women and um, sort of people who don't want to spend where you could argue that there's fewer years of education that gets you to being a lawyer and it in, you know the kinds of implications that has for life course politics could be different uh, and so there's actually an advantage to becoming a lawyer at 21 that is um, that puts certain kinds of actors at a somewhat advantage and I can talk more about that if anyone's interested but um, the 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 sort of focus of the NLU says for better or worse been a five-year model uh, this isn't to like undo any of the three-year models that exist and I think there are some schools that are thinking through what hybrid models should look like in doing some of the advantages of the five-year model or the or the ethos of the five-year model but doing it in doing it in a three-year platform um, but yeah the the unfortunately I don't I don't think this is I don't think the focus is going to shift towards structurally changing what the NLUs do. I don't see that as the future typically. And Anup and Sarab, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think it's much more likely that um, um, that that's going to, it's, it's much more likely that other schools that do three-year um, degrees will take from the ethos of this rather than the other way around. Uh I mean, I, I've, um, I genuinely think that, yes, you're right. In, you're right in terms of thinking that, if at all anything, uh, the, the three-year law degree is under uh, tremendous stress. And, but I have come to reassess my view on that in terms of saying that I think it's good for students to come into law school having done a degree already and uh, um, ha having had that exposure and that cer certain kind of reading before they come into law school. Uh, um, yeah, and, and just because it's, and, and, and I think that speaks to the difficulty of interdisciplinary education in law schools, right? And, and how it hasn't received the kind of attention that it requires. Right? Uh, and that interdisciplinarity has, has just not been strong enough to ground legal education in the five year model. So I, I see this, this like spew of questions. So if all of us right. get to answering each of these questions, we're going to lose track of it. We don't have that much time to go. Um, so maybe, maybe one model is to start thinking of patterns between these. So there's a question in chat about. Um, uh, retention policy and practice and skewed incentive schemes. And I, and I do, uh, Akanksha is, is someone who teaches at Nalsar and has been there for 11 months. Um, well, I, I just wanted to, I mean, it takes off from what Anup was talking about in terms of the tension between um, doing research versus also thinking about teaching. Like for me, for example, teaching is like really political. Like it's, it's where that is my politics. Like it's not, a, it's not a day job. Like I think of how I train my students and what they do out in the world as a really specific social movement. Um, and so, um, and Anub, I, I love that you said you don't like teaching or like you want to do less teaching, but everything you do is teaching. Teaching is not just what happens in the classroom, right? Like you running these startups across the country is still teaching. And you, so I, I think of like, I think, I think of this like scholar activist model as like being represented in a range of ways. And, um, but Akanksha, the point about, about um, contract employment, especially for women and especially for people who cannot negotiate out what that even means goes back to like the structure of how uh, people in pe people who are negotiating these these um, people who are negotiating these contract employment schemes um, ha are in a specifically vulnerable position because what what results in the contract extending is not the same thing that makes them a really good academic right okay. and also um, it may it forces people it forces actors to choose from a place of scarcity. So um, Rupali Samuel, who I think is in the audience and I have this research project like tracking um, women's careers in, uh, in legal academia and like sort of how they've negotiated contracts over time and like what it even means to like be a woman academic in the law school right now and who's doing the work of that legal academic in, in India. And I think um, so much of it reveals that this is definitely seen as temporary positions that people will just take. It's not seen as a career, it's seen as a job. And 
as far as I'm concerned, like changing that shift of what organizations think of these as for people, um, in terms of think of it as not just a job that they're trying to extend or be benevolent about, but rather recognize that this is a career choice that people are making and investing in uh, will change the mode. So I don't think it's an easy fix of just changing what the organization should do differently, but it has to be an institutional shift to recognize that these are careers that people are investing in. Um, and for the sustainability of both the actor and the organization, like sort of changing how we treat them um, institutionally is crucial. And, and so I'm so glad you brought that up because I think it's so important, especially for younger faculty and especially for, um, for women. If I can chip in on this issue of contractualization, one of the things that we need to appreciate is that contractualization within NLUs is also part of the broader pattern of contractualization of workforce all across the, not just the country, perhaps all and one thinks more concerted manner is collective bargaining by mm -hmm. teachers because at the end of the day we are employees and if you look at some of the arbitrary ad hoc manner in which decisions on tenure decisions on various employment conditions are being done in various law schools perhaps there's need for greater degree of organization among faculty of course, unionization for various reasons has acquired a certain degree of pejorative connotation in India. And, but there's no way really around it. If we are employees, if we are workers, then collective bargaining is the way in which workers must assert their rights. And teachers must also think about association, associational strength in a more serious manner. Also, from the other side, the other big challenge with NUJS comparatively compa in relation to a lot of other NLUs has had a fairly more open policy towards tenure and com comparatively a lot, many more of us actually got contracts early and ten tenure early. But there are also challenges in terms of UGC norms. So without your net exam and others, many universities are unwilling to give tenured position to NLU alum, which then means that contract appointments have often become the parallel way through which people have been taken. So that's one of the things that needs to be addressed. Also, some universities and some administration, if I have to be politically incorrect, also prefer to use contractual faculty because then it enables them to have a set of people who will be willing to do their biding without any hesitation. And I think unless we have greater transparency and systematization and institutional transparency in administration of law schools, perhaps contractualization may become a routine feature. And it's not just NLUs. If you look at all other universities, you, for example, for years and years, they simply thought through ad hoc faculty without any recruitment at all. So these are things that needs to be addressed largely. And I, I certainly believe as a labor law teacher that unionization is something that we'll have to think in a very serious manner. Some of the older universities have teachers associations. Why should NLUs stay away from that? There's, uh, there's a question on, is the entire structure of NLUs and this is especially true of Narusar, which is physically distant from law, uh, which is physically distant from law actually practiced, built on a very classist idea of theoretical law instead of practical. Uh, the combination of high cost, limited practicality, and overall limited pra practically, overall limited practically trained teachers seem to push towards it. Okay. And I guess the question is about, uh, Again, going back to the theory versus practice and uh, uh, limited practicality of the education given by people, taught by people who have uh, who have limited practical experience. Saurabh, do you want to take that question on theory, practice, practicality? Uh, yeah, practically trained. Ah, uh, it's always a fairly tricky balance to achieve and maybe law schools haven't really arrived at that right balance. One limitation as the question itself points out, many of our faculty 
haven't had extensive practical experience themselves, so which also means that our capacity to inculcate practical experiential learning is limited. Also, the other challenge is class size. If you are thinking in terms of more clinical collaborative learning, we have to think in terms of class size of 15, 20 for a group of people. That for 60, 80, or 120, as many law schools now have, some of these cannot really be achieved. But fundamentally, the question that Anup also raised, what is the role of law school? Is it to train people for professions? Or is it to inculcate the basic legal reasoning? And I certainly believe that at least the fundamental concepts need to be taught much better before we go into something else. But the problem is we haven't been able to do the additional, what I would see as the icing on the cake or the layering that comes in. And maybe greater degree of hiring of adjunct faculty, greater scope for collaborative teaching. Also think more in terms of clinical education and clinical education, not just as this clinical course, but also in terms of having clinical component in different courses together. Yeah. It would require a radical reorientation of the ways in which we teach. In fact, many of us don't even have a clear cut forum for dialogue with other faculty so that we can engage in collaboration. So these are challenges that law schools will have to address and faculty will have to be a lot more open in joining hands with fellow colleagues and maybe yeah. think in terms of teaching two or three courses together and then maybe bring in clinical components, some of the experiential component in each one of them. But without significant investment in adjunct faculty and without significant in investment in increasing the size of the faculty, I believe this would remain a problem because yeah. given the current manpower or human resources that we have, to do a good job of both the foundational concepts as well as practical teaching might not really be possible. Uh, and as uh, far as is, is the concept of NLUs itself elitist, perhaps it is because I have slowly started to veer towards the position that some of the fundamental edifice of NLU education needs to be thought through, whether it's the three year courses whether it's the financial structure or whether it's the pattern of teaching that we have. Yeah. Uh, is, is I'm actually going to, there are two questions here that I think have synergies and I'm not going to read out the whole question, but between Ashwin and um, Prajwal, there are these questions about um, making community in law school the classist idea of, I mean, one part of it is the classist idea of theoretical law versus practical and you started to talk about it. Um, but then that also fits in with like, how do you think of campus experience is important and how classist that is. Um, and we haven't spoken about the individual law student in the NLU culture. And I think it's important to put a plug there about how isolating NLU, the sort of law, law school culture can be. And I mean the NLUs by this for actors who aren't socialized outside the law school to be able to um, get these you know navigate law school in a specific sort of way so all of the experiences that are there right like so the sbc elections which is a gendered classist deeply problematic setup uh anup smiling because he knows why politics about that setup <laughs> um you know student journals um you know the moots the debates all of these all of these um all of these co-curricular activities uh, as well as the ways in which someone is successful in law school is a classist enterprise, whether you like it or not. And um, the and I don't think the answer, I mean, at least for me, I don't think it's a, um, I, I think on the one hand, there's a very specific mobility story in terms of a new kind of middle-class student who can become a lawyer and become an effective lawyer through the NLU program that just was not available as a movement strategy uh, even 10 years ago, right? So I, I definitely do think that there is a path to, um, there is a path to mobility that the NLUs offer that is unique and it's important to categorize and recognize. But alongside that path is also a deeply uh, classist, casteist, casteist um, sort of heteropatriarchal setup that defines who does well in an NLU, right? And so, um, so the question of like COVID comes up in terms of what is what is this going to do with new students who don't have the skills to navigate these experiences, how are they going to hone these skills? Because research shows time and again that like um, 
all these skills determine how successful you're going to be after law school in ways that your grades are not, your grades are just one predictor, right? Grades matter, but really grades matter in addition to all of these other uh, markers of how you're a good law student or a successful law student or an innovative law student. All those words are just ways of doing class, right? All those words are what kind of internships did you have? What kind of networks could you navigate? What, you know, there's someone asked about placement cultures. Like placements are not just your final job. They're also what your internships are, who you could, how you knew what the right path to doing that is. We're, we're doing a study now on networks in law schools and how different kinds of social capital you had before you entered law school changes the kinds of relationships you have in law school, how you study in law school, how you participate in different activities in law school, who your friends are, what you think a good outcome is in, a, in an exam or in, a, or in a conversation or in a networking event, whatever it is. And I think that really matters, especially now because COVID, what COVID really has done and you know, I don't know if you guys are going back in the fall to teaching um, in person, but you know, I, I don't see that as something that's going to happen here. And, and I think what that's essentially done is made people reinvest and reset what they can rely on to have success within this model, right? It's because you're not going to be able to do this in law school. You can create it anew in some new context. So you're going to have to rely on past sort of advantages that you have, whether that means you know people from before you because how how are employers going to um be able to differentiate between one student and another all these ways in which you can differentiate yourself are sort of gone and so the worrying thing about this process is who it's going to differentiate and on what grounds and how these background assumptions of you know we're all equal we're meritocratic we do this so uh, progressively is actually quite a sham and we are elitist structures even those of us that are part of um sort of you know, even, even the national schools that like, there's a lot of merit. I mean, there's enough of an argument about meritocratic mobility, but underlying it is a deeply, deeply um, set structure of inequality that we reproduce with new kinds of eliteness. And I just wanted yeah. to put that out there as a, as a master comment to respond to some of the questions you're asking, because I think there, yeah. are, there are logics there that can get unpacked. Yeah. And I mean, as, as somebody who teaches uh, first year students uh, in the first semester that they come in um, and then they teach legal methods. Uh, language is, is such a fundamental point of uh, discrimination, Absolutely. right? Uh, and and it, there's no other word, it is discrimination, right? Um, and, 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 and that journey itself from day one is catch up. And that, and that, and that, disadvantage of, of our medium of instruction, the way in which campus activities are carried out, the way patterns of socialization happen on campus are so language driven, right? And it's, so, it's, it's a barrier that is so difficult to break. And, 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 and it's, it's so heartbreaking. And I was, I was and it's not, I mean, I was, I was, I don't want to use the word interesting. It is really heartbreaking to see the patterns that develop over the, over the first semester, who is talking to whom, uh, who is uh, raising their hands to speak in class, uh, who's, who are the kind of people who slowly not attending class, who are not paying attention, right? It's, it's and, and, and we really need to think that the diversity conversation cannot stop at the point of entry in terms of reservation, right? And, and that's one of the big problems with our imagination of reservation. We think that uh, just facilitating entry is, is the be all and end all. And, and, and I think actually uh, nurturing that diversity uh, is a much more long-term project within the university. And we seem to just forget all of that the moment that we put uh, 85 students into a classroom uh, and assume that everybody has uh, equal ability. Uh, and, and, and that really has been a personal struggle of teaching first years over the last four years. This is a language, just the ability to comprehend what you are saying in the classroom. Uh, it, and, and we really need to find some answers to that. Right? Uh, yeah. Just to feed into what Shweta was saying. How do NLUs get more? The three of you spoke about faculty members who've had a huge impact in your career. How does a university like Nalsad attract better faculty and ensure their retention? Treat faculty better. Um, 
you know, like actually have this, I think, I think, the, and, and I think, and, you know, I say, this is why I said the outsider comment, it's so easy to like pass this judgment and, and write a little check and say, this is what people should do. Um, sitting in a US institution that has been doing this a particular way for as long as it has, right? Like it's really easy to say like, oh, what you really need is better curated spaces for research. That's a really easy thing to say, but having, um, having been in these spaces in different capacities, I just feel like that, that transition is not that easy. Like, but I think changing the culture of remembering that really having good faculty or, you know, having people, you know, the, having the 66 of you on this call, like sort of learn more about legal academia and like maybe some of you are students that start to then think of this as an actual career option and start to invest in it and start to write and care about research and get really and involved in wanting your, wanting your politics too, to be through teaching, right? Like, and then you join these schools and, Unfortunately, right now it works at a model where um, unique actors within really, really systematic, uh, systematically unresponsive institutions have managed to, beyond all odds, make it work, right? And that takes so much struggle. It takes so much burden. I've had, I've seen it happen to our professors. I see it now happen to my friends who are colleagues, right? Like there's so much investment that you have to put in to like literally just do the same thing that other people take for granted. Um, and, and I say that both with so much, um, so much empathy for that struggle, but also just recognizing how much that is worth and, and just, putting it out there as saying that it isn't just an easy shift. Um, it's unfortunately dependent on actors making, making this very specific choice. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that entirely. I was just going to say, uh, talking of Nalsar, I, I was, they refused to hire me twice, right? Uh, uh, but, and, and I'm saying that the, the, the story there is that, uh, as, as Sweta was saying, is I don't think it's an institutional story of even these conversations about which NLUs attract better uh, faculty. Um, it's very much an individual story. I think the, it's despite the system and not because of the system, right? And uh, uh, and I guess we all have our own reasons for why we're doing what we're doing um, and not hopping over state borders, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the system, the incentive structure in the system is so messed up. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's mind boggling that the system survives. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, in terms of specifics, I think NLUs can learn a lot from what IITs and IIMs have done. And I think they've been far more successful in creating an academic culture where they can retain some of the faculty, not all IIMs, not all, all IITs, but by in general, most of them have been far more successful, largely in creating, as Anup said, the right incentives, but also in far more supportive structure for where people who engage in scholarship, people who engage in teaching are not really interfered with in a very dramatic or direct manner. And I think that's something that needs to be cherished. Because as much as we enjoy teaching, as much as we enjoy perhaps all the other paraphernalia associated with teaching, there are certain factors in terms of administrative interference and others, which not a lot of people have been able to tolerate. And if you look at most of the law schools who have attracted alums from NLUs, not that NLUs are the only place from where you can get good young people. But you'd find that they have not been particularly successful in ensuring that a lot of them stay back. And I think we need to dig deeper why that has happened. While one can certainly speak of an overall structure, but even if we don't compare it with Western universities, I think IIMs and IITs can tell us much more in terms of concrete things that have been done and that have held them much better compared to our experience with them. It's a great point. So. There's a question here about online legal education. Um, and I'm not sure if that question is about online legal education um, in the time of COVID or replacing 
or, or like sort of um, my law type things that are replacing um, legal education or, or adding to it. And I think, I really don't think that model, and, I, and I've been involved with people who've thought about this model and really critically think, thought through whether this is a useful model to add. Um, I, don't, I don't think that model was ever meant to replace legal education. It was always meant to like increase the access to who could subsidize their learning or add to their learning or supplement their learning in addition to other sorts of training. And to that end, I think it's a really important model, right? Like I think everyone is not going to be able to go to a national law school. Um, everyone doesn't need to go to a national law school to do what they need to do, right? Like this is not the be all and end all of legal education. I think for a country um, with the size and the sort of disparities that India has, it is central that there are different kinds of models that get us all to the places that we want to get to and not just one way in which to do it. Uh, because no matter how meritocratic or how equal you are, if a class only takes 80 to 100 people, it's not going to be equal. It doesn't matter how great the institution is. It's still not going to be able to serve all of the people it wants to. Like I, my standing joke is that sure, I got into one of these schools, but I also got in when it wasn't that hard to get into. And it can't possibly be that we were one of the 50 top best legal minds in the country, right? Like that wasn't, I mean, the, the causation is so reversed in this case that I think it's going through the process that makes you who you are not getting in because it's because the numbers just don't work in that way. Um, and so I think to that end, online legal education as a as a way in which to, think about other models in which you can do this alongside this. It's never going to replace what hierarchical models are, but I think it is worthwhile having more democratized ways of thinking through uh, legal education. And again, the same, the same points we've been making about being thoughtful about who's doing the teaching there, being thoughtful about how we <clears throat> curate those courses, that doesn't change. That, happen, that should be there for online, online education too. Um, but as it happens, I just feel like the few models I do know have been thinking about it thoughtfully. So if that stays, there is potential in that. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical of this, even, even before COVID, in terms of this push for, uh, from the MHRD for uh, online learning and MOOCs. And I think there is something to democratizing spaces like the university. Uh, to that so, to that social project of learning, uh, which is so important in terms of many of the things that uh, Shweta was talking about, uh, in terms of the kind of uh, that that mobility is achieved only through going through those processes in university, right? And 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 the online space is just not conducive for that. Uh, and, and and that's and it's not just a COVID specific response. Uh, this whole push on we must have more moves and, uh, you know, that's how we are going to get, uh, have access to uh, legal education. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that because I, I, I don't think it's, it's that democratizing effect is not going to be there. I disagree, but I think that's the point of the panel. There's a question on research centers, Anup. Um, how do you ensure oh. research centers function better or at least functions of the function even a little in universities such as Nalsar, which don't get enough funding or so we're told? I right. have no idea about the funding Nalsar has, but yeah. I know both of you can speak to research centers. No, see, uh, I mean, to be, to, be, to be fair, I think uh, NLU Delhi is considered to be one of the better funded uh, uh, law schools, uh, but even the actual finances of uh, this university will tell you that uh, it does, even if you combine um, uh, the fees that we collect plus the grants that we get, we're still running on a deficit, right? I mean, in the sense that we do find, we have found other ways to make up that, but just year on year, if you look at total expenses and whether fees and uh, the government grant covers. There have been other ways that have been found to cover up that, uh, but that's and, and and you're talking of a university that's considered to be well funded. So, I think the funding crisis is a very very real one in, in law schools and has and that has such tremendous ramification for all the things that we've been talking: uh, inclusivity, diversity, uh, incentive structures, producing research. 
right? How is all of that going to happen? And I think it's a combination of factors. I think one is law schools not being creative enough to uh, uh, think about other funding models and to just say that they're just going to be dependent on uh, just student fees and government grants and if, and therefore then also playing into the hands of the government in terms of uh, interference that Saurav was talking about. Um, and, and I think that, and, and you, you, you just had, you have to be, we just have to find ways as NLUs to raise more funding, right? Uh, and, and, and the answer, unfortunately, and a lot of unrest in the law schools uh, seem to be around increasing fees. And that unfortunately seems to be the only imagination that is in play that with rising costs and lesser and lesser state support, uh, the universities are tending to uh, raise the fees. And of course, when you raise the fees, there are higher expectations from students and quite reasonably so. And the institutions are not capable of responding to that demand. Um, and I think, and I, and that's one thing. I, I, I do lay some fault at the door of the law schools themselves in terms of just not having that imagination, right? But also at the, at also at the law firms, right? And as a sort of very uh, specific of, of corporate entities that have immensely benefited from these institutions, right? Uh, and, and, have, and have really given very little back, right? Uh, and that's, that's, a responsibility. I don't. I don't think we. I don't think we. I don't think law schools know how to ask, right? Uh, we don't know how to ask, and neither. And 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 because I guess we haven't asked really, or we haven't asked in the manner that it should be asked. Uh, we haven't received any support either. Um, yeah. So, uh, so research centers. It's um, at least personally for me, it has been a huge learning curve on how to raise funding. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's but even even that is very much work in progress. Right. Uh, it's it's the kind of conversations you need to have and the number of people you need to talk to and what you need to tell them and what appeals to them and what. Yeah, I, 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 somehow academics are not built for that. Uh, at least I, it doesn't come to me naturally. Uh, it's something that I've had to train myself in. And uh, yeah, it's it's. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a need to do it much more professionally for the law schools, uh, be able to do all the things that we've been talking about. Can I just say two things? Like, so Anu, your comment made me think about um, your comment about how law schools don't know how to ask. It reminded me of like how even twenty years on, we have the same power dynamics between firms and law schools and our asking capabilities than we did twenty years ago, and it's. And it's really interesting because our power dynamics, you would imagine, have shifted because there are more alumni in these yeah. law firms. These law firms are, I mean, I study these law firms. And so this is like my, this is, I think about this power loop a lot. And it's interesting that the hesitation to ask for funding in these spaces is still the same as it was when we were the second batch and wondering if like a top law firm would come to our <laughs> first day, you know, it's like, Oh my God, Amachan and Zia are both coming to hire us. That's amazing. Right? Like this happened. Um, this was the case in the early 2000s. So the fact that it's still the case in the early 2020s is crucial because it's reminding us that even though actually we do have more power, we somehow are resisting the capacity to claim that power from it. So what's the worst that's going to happen? These firms are going to say, no, we're going to go to another NLU. No, they're not. We're actually way more powerful as a school than we were 20 years ago. And so that, that mobilization, uh, so speaking of mobilization, the COVID relief, migration worker relief that NASA is doing right now is amazing. I just got a note about it. And it made me think of how um, if we were to put our resources together and actually mobilize, going back to sort of the original point, better and with more clarity, especially the alumni, there are ways in which to rethink how to change that power dynamic. Um, and I think, um, and that goes to this point about deans, which is the last question that we haven't dismissed. Sorry, guys, I've been answering all these questions by text on the side while we've been talking. Um, and they aren't comprehensive answers. And so to anyone on this who wants to reach out to us and have these conversations further, 
All of us have public email IDs, so you can write to us. Um, but I just want to say one more plug for institutional actors with a lot of what I call charismatic capital, right? Um, Anup, now I was in law school and I was hired by the same dean that Anup works for now, right? Like, and having an actor who both knows how to deal with um, funding issues and is just a good strategic manager and knows how to raise money for the people he believes in is such a crucial part of making things like this work, right? Having people who say, yeah, I really believe in your project. I'm going to try and help you make it work. So having that one dean or having one person at the top who's both a strategic partner, but also really believes in the power of individual actors within the school can make such a big difference. And so I just wanted to put a plug out there for Ranbir Singh, because I think for, I mean, or, or actors like that in these different schools who, um, are both an advantage in that they can do this when they're at the top, but the high disadvantage is that it depends then on one actor and not the school. So it's not an institutional culture. It's like whether you're in or out, depending on a specific actor at a specific point of time in a specific school. And so while on the one hand, it feels like it's worth mentioning it, what it really highlights is how unsustainable the, the setup is. So um, someone asked about email IDs. Google us. All of us have public email IDs, so you, you should be able to get it. Uh, on the funding thing, I must say, uh, am I still on mute? No, we can hear you, sir. <laughs> yeah. It's not as if law schools haven't raised money, except that we haven't raised money for research. If you look at funding, moot travel or <laughs> gold medals, we have actually been able to raise quite a bit of money on gold medals. But that emphasis on raising money for research on a serious basis hasn't been even at attempted by most NLEs. And I think that's why perhaps some degree of professionalization is required. Maybe academics are not particularly adept at this. <laughs> but it's not as if law firms or other organizations in the private sector would be unwilling. They have been very generous every time some requests have been. And I think that's an opportunity that needs to be used in a carefully concerted manner by law schools. And I think, I think law schools don't understand the fundamental point that good research is expensive, right? Uh, it's not, uh, uh, you know, they, they seem to think somehow magically these things uh, will just happen. Uh, and then, and, and, and yeah, there's, uh, and, and, and I think a lot of this speaks to a much larger issue of what I think we were discussing in the, in the pre event call that. With so much happening in the country, why are the law schools uh, so voiceless, right? Uh, wh what explains, uh, with so much happening in the country, um, the, the rather serious marginalizing of the law schools right? mm -hmm. in terms of uh, as 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 universities, right? Uh, of course, there might be some actors who graduated from these who are playing a crucial role in the act, I mean, are, are involved in that, in those conversations outside, but as institutions, uh, what do you, I mean, yeah, how do you guys see that? I mean, I mean, the lack of law schools as political actors has been fascinating to watch, right? Like, because on the one hand, they train what I think of as like hypercritical actors, right? Like they have the potential to claim, claim they have the, ugh, they have the potential to train hypercritical actors, right? But as a, when it comes to social movements and their ability to make interventions in it, um, and when I say they, I guess I should be careful. Like, am I thinking of students? Am I thinking of faculty? Am I thinking yeah. of you know, stuff? And each of those people have different reasons not to be invested in it because law schools are policed differently than other schools, right? So it's not the same thing as being able to take the streets or having like a protest. Um, and not having it come up or show up in your academic transcript or like not have someone threaten you that this is a thing that they're going to put in the national newspaper, right? Like I, rem I remember this um, maybe five years ago, like when, when um, someone went to a bar in Hyderabad and then it was like the local news about how, you know, women were doing these immoral things. And of course you can like laugh that off or you can say, oh, that was a political act. 
but it isn't because it sort of reminds you like how policed students are by not just not just external audiences but by the law schools themselves which makes it really hard i mean the cost to being a political actor from a law school is unintuitively hard and so that's that's worth taking into account and that's and i'm guessing that's true for faculty too right it's really um, you can make take these stances, but usually taking that stance requires you to have a certain amount of personal capital that you're willing to spend on the specific stand. And all of us make these associations, right? Like we all pick the battles we want to fight. We all know we only have X number of battles in us, especially if you're junior faculty coming up for tenure or your junior faculty. And also tenure means very different things in India as it does everywhere else, right? So what is, I mean, it, it, there's a, you know, there's the logic of, what a permanent contract means is also not permanent in the same way, which means, sure, you have a little bit more status than you did if you were, you know, re-employing your contract year after year, but you don't have enough to say, screw the institution, I'm going to like go off on my own, because where are you going off on your own? Like, how much can you reject, right? So all of us are making these cost benefit analysis to when we want to be political, in what way, who are we going to offend by being political in a specific sort of way? And it's, tiring and I and I again like I you know I, I think it's important to recognize that the cost to being political and the incentives to being political right so being political in a law school in the US is actually adding to your sort of status as a law professor because then it reminds people that you have a voice you're curating your voice by having political actions I don't see it as being the same or at least not in the same linear way right so Anup and Saurabh, you both tried to do this in your own ways and you have and not, but you've also had to be really careful about what the causes you've decided to put your capital behind, right? I mean, and, and how many fights you're willing to get your hands dirty for, and that doesn't mean you don't have a dog in the other fights. It literally means there's only so many fights you have the bandwidth for while you also want to do other things that are important. So I just, I mean, I, I think this goes back to the high horse comment, right? Like, it's really easy to say, oh, you don't have a political thought because you didn't say X when this terrible thing happened. And you're like, no, it just, I mean, I, I'm angry all the time. You just don't know how angry I am or you don't listen to my rant about how angry I am all the time because I don't have it in me to constantly reapply my political status. And, and, that's, and that's worth mentioning. Mm. The exhaustion of it is worth mentioning. Sara? You're on mute, Sara. Uh, at one level, we need to also appreciate the fact that the degree of dependence that many of the law schools have on state government support yeah. also means that they are necessarily very risk averse. So that plays into faculty approach also, because one of the battle then you have to fight, even on very minor things are who are the speakers you invite to the law school, what kind of programs you organize. And even those become major battlegrounds. So at some level, that itself exhausts our energy in some ways to borrow from what Shweta said. But I also wonder, to play devil's advocate, can the institution as a political force really make singular intervention, given that different members within the university community will have different views? If you look at the whole CA debate, I remember there were different groups of students saying, well, this petition is not something that we support. We are for the act. And same divide was quite visible within the alumni body. And I'm sure within the faculty also, there are very strongly held opinions. Now, some of us may feel that the other side was completely illegitimate, but that doesn't in any manner detract from the fact that there would be plurality of opinions. So yeah. I think we also need to be a real, little realistic about the intervention that faculty, students, or alumni bodies can do, and university as a collective body can do. And but, one I, thing, I, I, sorry, I'll, just to finish, on a matter like, let's say, the Justice Verma Committee report and the 2013, the whole mobilization that happened at that point, comparatively, there wasn't a significant divide. Almost every, there might have been differences on detail, but pretty much. Uh, large cross-section of the legal community and the wider civil society were in agreement that yes, changes have to happen. But very few political matters would find similar, if not a complete consensus, uh, overlapping agreement of views. And that's something I'm not sure will always happen. So we also have to be a little skeptical about universities as an institution being in a position to take 
clear cut stances on certain debates yeah uh, i i mean i i was as as in my own question on the irrelevance of whatever which is a bit too drastic to call it the relevance of law schools in larger national uh, debates was not as much about institutions taking one position on let's say caa uh, but generally i meant uh, whatever might emerge and it might be this diversity of opinion uh, emerging and engaging with those issues in whatever form it might be right uh, and i think that uh, general apathy right uh, is is what that one senses and of course there might be exceptions and uh, there might be Uh, certain students who are very active but generally as spaces generating that engagement uh, i just find it to be lacking across law schools and it might be something to do with uh, the kind of consequences that shweta was talking about in terms of high marks for attendance you know that it's a sort of professionally run you can't you know institutions have had problems with putting up posters what will recruiters think if they came and saw me too posters uh in in law schools right and i think it 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 also goes back to that imagination of what are we doing in the law schools right uh it it it, it raises that concern of um you know let's 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 just stay out of this right or just let's focus on that uh, uh very individualized model of uh training for the future profession You know, speaking of exhaustion, I see that we're sort of—it's a natural end. Yeah. We're at, <laughs> and, we're at yeah. and I and I recognize that you guys are way later in the day uh, where you're at than where I'm at. Um, right. So perhaps this Thank is a you. good segue. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking out time for this discussion. This was a very unique discussion in itself, and I'm sure it must have broadened everyone's perspective to look at legal education in NLU's. I thank you all for taking out time for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for well, having. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, and thanks to all the listeners as well. Yeah. I know fifty Perfect. people still showing up. That's crazy. Uh, so we put the. I've I've taken the liberty of putting both of your public email addresses on, on the chat. So yeah. ask us any more questions if you have them. But uh, thanks again for the invite, and it was good to see the thanks. two of you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank thanks you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye.